Well, greetings again, YouTube. On this podcast, we have a bit of a special review going on because it's a limited special presentation film, which I was surprised I actually got in my local theater. I guess we've now grown in size enough around here that we've considered a venue for some of these limited releases. Today's, of course, being The Raid Redemption. Uh, a rather interesting film that I think is the first wide release of an Indonesian film in the United States. Although, I say it's an Indonesian film, it's you know, obviously filmed in the area, it's filled with Indonesian actors, and but it is directed by a Welshman. Yeah, uh, interesting international mix you have here. We have a... Uh, uh, Gareth Evans, a Welsh director, and in this case also a Welsh writer as well, directing an Indonesian language film with Indonesian actors. Uh, but regardless, I really don't care where a movie comes from. I care if it's good or not. And this is a damn good action film. Um, is it high drama? No. Is it a deep, artsy film? No. It's a fun Asian action film. It's got serious moments to it. It's got some underlying themes. Uh, I think that's where the redemption element comes in with the uh, with the brothers. Mm. It's it's an it's a basically Hong Kong action movie, although this replaced Hong Kong with Jakarta. Uh, the film came highly recommended to me actually from a friend of mine who's seen it at the Toronto Film Festival. Uh, so, of course, when I saw this popped up, I wasn't even looking for this. Normally, we don't have these special showings around here. Uh, you don't have to go to North Jersey for the theaters for that, or New York. But, uh, as I was checking out stuff for uh, Lockout, this, which is coming out this week, or this coming weekend, uh, I saw this listed, and I was surprised. Um... Hell, even if I pull up IMDb here, it says uh, in four theaters near Newark, New Jersey. And that's what it's listing as the nearest theater for me. Uh, just because to show you that don't look at IMDb for local theater times. Uh, so what shall I say about this film? Um, it's got to be... Ha the, the fight scenes, very well choreographed. I mean, that is where the meat... the the meat and potatoes of this film are, are the fight scenes. You go to see it for the fights, and they are extremely well choreographed, extremely well shot, and brutal as fucking hell. I This has got to be some of the more brutal fights I have seen on camera. Because uh, when th these guys, they show the guys fighting as you would expect someone to, well, not as you would expect someone to fight in real life, because they do see some crazy moves and stuff that, you know, you'd be dead if you actually tried it in a real fight. But it's brutal, especially when the guy is, when they do the knife fights, and they have a lot of knife fights in this movie, and it's brutal when they stab people. Because not only do they, they just have, oh, you're stabbed in the chest, you're not instantly dead. You know, they pull it out, the guy's wiggling around on the floor for the next five minutes. Uh, and they don't stab him once, either. It's a brutal, like, stab, 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 stab. Okay, now you're dead. No, uh, jeez. After watching this, whew, I couldn't say this. Do not fuck with Indonesian cops if they're anything like this. Hmm. At the beginning of the movie, hell, they're even before they even get into anything. Anyone's even been arrested. First person they see, they go up and go rote them. <laughs> like these are cops, not special forces. Granted, that it's Indonesia. They might do things a little differently over there. And let's face it. They probably do things a lot differently in a lot of places. I'm sure if you're in the slums of Rio, the, the cops there are not acting as they would here in the New Jersey suburbs. Yeah, you love more, a little bit more life or death, you gotta go a little bit more extreme measures. Hell, they even, they even go and fucking shoot kids in this one. The police do. <laughs> okay, the one corrupt cop does. So, it's not that bad. Uh, but, but the basic premise of the movie is that there is a... An apartment complex that is controlled by a drug kingpin and a SWAT team is sent in to arrest this group. Now, if elements of that film or elements of that plot sound a little bit like New Jack City, well, I guess they are a bit. But hey, this happens in real life. Um, at first, actually, though, I will give this film some credit. There was a lot of what looked like classic movie 
cliches that you just want to nitpick. Like they're just well, one is they were just giving like they were giving the briefing as they're driving to the uh, uh, the location, the, the building, and you're kind of go really. You're giving them the briefing like five minutes before they actually have to do it. You might want to have this more planned out. Um, they can't call for backup because the one guy... And now, they actually answer all these questions, um, which is a bit of a spoiler territory. I don't know I don't know if I want to get into that quite yet, of why there's a, why they were doing that in the plot. But there are some cliches that, at least at first, I was like, going, really, we're going with that cliche and that type of cliche that you can just tear apart? And they kind of at least answer them. Uh, there's at least a reason why. Although, I think the, I think the cops do got to get killed. They really should have questioned... Why only 20 of them? Because they show this building, and this thing is massive, and you're just going, why aren't there 100 police officers doing this? I mean, really. In real life, an operation like this, they would pull in 100 cops. So it would not be a, a, a willy-nilly little operation with 20 officers to secure an entire, this massive building. Way too big. But alas, um... They go in a scene somewhat reminiscent, I think, of uh, that uh, the scene from The Rock. Uh, they get alerted. Uh, most of the cops get massacred. Actually, the the first kind of 15 minutes there, it's a uh, pretty intense gunfight. Although uh, the director really does a much better job with the martial arts than he does with gunfights. Uh, they're exciting. They're passable, but uh, the uh, the gunfight I've seen better. Done, I've seen them done better. Uh, you can tell the director's strength is in choreogra- uh, choreographing fights and in shooting fights. I mean, there's no shaky cam or anything like that when they fight. You can see everything that's going on. The The editing is not cut that quickly to where, you know, you have some of these things where you have some, you have some movies and directors out there that cut so quick that you cannot read your eyes and your brain to readjust in a new scene. And so you you miss it. You mentally miss it. That's the, that's the problem with quick cuts. A lot of people don't realize why they don't like quick cuts. And that's because when you just cut very quickly, your your mind takes a second to reevaluate what's being shown to it. And so when you're kind of just quick cut, show a punch, quick cut, show, your mind's still adjusting to that last punch, and you're falling behind the plot, so you lose track of what's going on. Some people which that are very good at this kind of quick change can follow a quick cut. I can follow those quick cut fights. I don't like it. I, I think it's a bad scene because it does take a little bit more mental... Your brain starts working overtime for what is supposed to be a sit back and have fun scene. I can follow them, but I don't like them. But uh, this guy does not do those quick instant continual cuts. He has some shots that last a while. I mean, you do want to cut a bit during an action, so you don't want to keep it completely static, although sometimes that is fun. They, uh, they did that in a Tony Jaw film, where it's this really long, one solid take fight scene, uh, which was great. It's impressive, but yeah, I do understand also when you're doing a uh, fight scene like this, these guys have to take multiple takes, and the longer the cut... The uh, the more more likely you are to have to shoot the scene several times over because they're so complicated, especially these fight these moves. They do some fairly complicated moves here, uh, some rather fairly complicated and extremely brutal, which I can only imagine was hell on the actors. <clears throat> so the longer a cut is, yeah, you know, the more likely you are going to have problems. You know, somebody's going to mess it up slightly. You've got to reshoot the entire thing, reset up for the entire thing. So I get it when they cut a little bit. And this film does a very good balance of that. Uh, do, 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 do. Anything else really worth talking about on this? Because it's, it's a good film. Uh, oh, I guess you should get a little bit into the plot. Uh, you basic, It's basically set up the SWAT team is going to go take in, and at first this looks like a standard setup until after everything goes south. You know, One of the lookouts spots them. They were a little hesitant because it was a kid. They still the one cop shoots him in the neck anyway, and when they're alerted, basically this the setup is this guy has been renting out most of the tenants are actually drug users, or, or gangsters or, or whatever. So he's able to encourage them to go kill the cops. He goes, you know, 
anybody that goes kills these guys, um, they get to stay here for free now. So it incentivizes the drug craze tenants who, by the way, mostly charge at them, at least especially in the first scenes when they have the guns. Um, these guys come out with like just boards and knives, and the cops fucking massacre most of them. They just open it up. Um, open up and kill most of them. And you kind of wonder, I mean, I guess the excuse is, yes, these guys are on drugs. That's why they thought... All right, uh, they're gonna offer me free stuff. Great! I have this really short knife. I can hear there's a gunfight going outside. I'm gonna bring this knife to the gunfight. Um, hell, there's one scene where uh, it's it's supposed to be tension, but I'm kind of just thinking like, this this guy is an idiot. Uh, he knows there's cops there. They just had a gunfight. He has no idea if the cops actually ran out of ammo, or just you know trying to hunker down because of overwhelming numbers. Here's like. He's the only one in the hallway, and he's doing this like tapping. He's got a fucking huge ass machete, and he's like tapping it on the uh, the walls to you know purposely kind of psych psych whoever he's hunting out. You know, kicks in the door, checks out, uh, no one's in there. Continues to tap it, so the yeah you know, the officers know exactly where he's at. But I'm thinking, because I wasn't made clear to me at least that they were fully out of ammo. You gotta be thinking like, is that really the smart thing to do? Because you're kind of letting the officers know exactly where you are. They're letting you know... You're letting them know you only have a machete. And you're not confident that they're out of ammo. So I'm pretty sure you're going to get around the whole corner and they're going to... They could pop you. The only reason they don't is because they, you know, they don't want everyone to know where they're at. <sighs> well, that's right. That guy got his comeuppings anyway. As when he was turned into a cushion. But, uh, as the cops kind of, they, the numbers are where they're down, they split up. Uh, it starts to get a little bit more revealed that what's going on. One, they want to call for backup, of course, as soon as things start going south and they lose their first few guys. But, when they ask the lieutenant who's in charge, she reveals he never got clearance for this. And at first, you're kind of wondering why. And I think the film subtly tries to misdirect you on this. At first, you think this lieutenant, and we're getting a little bit in the spoiler territory, might be just a really upstanding cop, and he didn't tell his bosses because then the, the dealers would find out about it. So you're, you're kind of subtly th th led to kind of think of that. At least I think that's what they wanted us to, wanted us to do. It wasn't until, and then later on it's revealed, he's actually, that this whole operation was a hit. In which case, you're wondering why this does bring up a plot hole. Uh, basically, the idea was he's going to go in. They're going to the idea that at least the this officer is using the SWAT team here and his and his position to go in and kill this drug lord because he's not paying people enough. He's not paying off enough cops. He's a dirty cop. But then at the end of the film, and this is where the and that works. Okay, we got the idea. He's all right, we get the ideal. Uh, not, it's that's an interesting twist on it. Uh, it's a mid-level guy. He's not big enough to authorize a raid, but big enough to actually order the uh, SWAT team in, a small enough SWAT team in, which explains a why there's not more cops, and uh, b why they can't call for backup. But at the end of the film or towards the end, it's revealed that, hey, uh, he was ordered to go kill this by upper, higher-level officers. Which then brings the question, why wasn't this... Well, all right, at this point in the film, he's gotten to the head drug dealer. Uh, Toma, I think, was his name? I forget. I forget yeah, Tama. And at that point, you're kind of... You know, the Tama's doing his little talk about, you know... Oh, you were sent here? Well, no. This was a hit on you. They, they, we were waiting for you. Which one? They clearly were not waiting for him. Um, one, the uh, Thomas two underlings seem surprised that there was a police raid happening. Two, they it didn't seem like they were really waiting, waiting for them to show up. So if this was an actual raid, this was uh, or this was supposed to be a hit on that officer. 
rather poorly planned. And two, why would you have it where you wouldn't would where you would set it up where he would bring in an entire SWAT team and get them killed? Uh, if you're a corrupt cop, you'd kind of probably want him to just get shot on the street. You know, why not just pay someone to go walk up to him in the middle of the street and put a bullet into him? You're going to lose at least fewer of your officers. Why get 20 of these other cops killed? Even corrupt cops, even corrupt cops tend not to want to get their fellow officers killed, especially if they're not, you know, directly causing any problems for them. And two, if this was ordered by higher ups, let's say Tama was kind of BSing, and this was he was actually following orders because it is is implied that the corrupt cop was there because somebody else told him to go and kill him. You know, why then weren't there more SWAT guys? Why wasn't this an officially organized raid? Uh, certainly, this seems like, based on the actions of the SWAT guys earlier on, it's going and kill basically anyone you think is really a bad guy. Um, seems like this wouldn't have been an issue. Uh, the other big thing, I think, when it comes to the redemption part, which, by the way, I, the Indonesian title is... Serban Mat, or uh, Serban Mat. I'm not sure on my pr- uh, pronunciations of Indonesian. Uh, basically, meant like deadly inv- it translates to something like deadly invasion. So this is an English title, and the English title does mean something very different. So I guess the redemption they're talking about is basically the main character. Why is it coming across uh, Tama's number two guy, the drug dealer's number two guy, who is the brains of the operation, and it turns out to be the main character's brother, who ha- they haven't seen each other. And lo and behold, the brother decides to spare his other, you know, the criminal brother decides to spare the cop brother's life, you know, tries to tell him to get on out, and by him sparing, he gets caught on camera saving his brother's life. So when he goes back to the drug dealer, lo and behold, they plan on the you know, stabs him into the, the hand. Basically says we're going to torture you in front of your brother when we when we get him. It turns in then to a fight between him and the other course classic. There's always you ever ever realize this is this is another kind of uh, classic. How should I say? What's the word I'm looking for? Trope. The, the classic trope with uh, criminal organizations and movies is there's always there's always the boss, then there's the brains, and then there's the crazy guy that wants to kill everything. Crazy guy in this one is fucking insane. Uh, but of course, like all crazy guys, is somehow a martial arts master. Which, by the way, pretty much it seems like every single person, every drug dealer, or every druggie apparently in Jakarta is a salat master. Because they all can fight. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. Wouldn't be a very good martial arts film if it wasn't. Hmm. Anyway. Uh, they wind up having a two-way fight with that, uh, with this guy, you know. They go, he takes, the, the mad dog winds up taking the brother down to be tortured, and lo and behold, the cop brother finds him. And the guy, this is his, right, he gets the crazy part, he decides to, one, let the brother release the, his other brother, let him get ready, and then he decides to fight them two on one. And surpri- does surprisingly well against both of these guys, although both of them have been beaten the crap out of. Uh, and I did not realize you could use a broken piece of uh, fluorescent light bulb to stab a man in the neck and then slit it, like pull it, like a fucking knife and slit the rest of the throat. It, that was brutal. I, I would normally would expect the uh, the bulb to break at that point. But I guess I was wrong. I guess they make them a little tougher in Indonesia. And there's not much else else to talk about with this film. A bunch of really good fight scenes. Um, it's a it's a light on words. I mean, there's there's elements where they had the one. Of course, there was a one good tenant. Who protects one of the other cops? Uh, lets him in. One of those classic scenes. Um, there's a couple of sniper guys, which we, I wish we got to see the sni- get, uh, something happen to those snipers at some point. There's they they wind up calling in a couple of uh, 
marksmen, the, the drug dealers do, to kind of take out the, the guys on the outside of the building and some of the other guys in the windows, and they kill enough cops, you kind of wish something happened to them, whether they kind of, yes, our hero kind of used, like, maybe, like, two bullets left in one of his guns to kind of just take out the snipers, you kind of wish something happened to those guys. Maybe in the sequel, because from what I understand, this has been a big enough success that they plan on making this into a trilogy. Uh, which I really can't argue with it being a success. It, According to IMDb, at least, it costs about $1.1 million to make. That is incredibly cheap. And it's it has a major international release. It's got awards, so of course, they're going to make this into a series. We'll see what they... I don't know how they're going to make this into a series, though, to be honest with you. It doesn't seem like there's a big franchise where the, or where they would, where the story would expand to. I mean, my guess is they do the fallout from this incident where they then go after the dirty cops. But would it, we'll see how the... Maybe the, the, the next one might not just be in one building, my guess is. My guess would be then they take the rookie cop from this one, our main protagonist, and he goes and he gets the authorization to go hunt down these dirty cops. And he goes around raiding, taking them down. That's my guess. Could be wrong. Could just be a rehash. Yeah, Hollywood and Hollywood's getting its hands on here. Uh, that's exactly what they might do. Just rehash the first one into something slightly different and not as good. I hope that's not the case. Well, that is it for this podcast. I really don't think there's much more to say about the film. Um, go see it, uh, if you can. Uh, if if it, the closest theater is very, very far away, and you're kind of wondering, is this you know, worth taking a massive trip for? Um, maybe not that... You know, I don't know if I... It's not one of those maybe I would recommend for a, you know really make a trek out of, but if it's like an hour's drive, go see it. Now that's an hour's drive for me thinking Jersey, so that can be a... I know in other parts of the country, driving an hour to the mo- go to the movies is actually a normal thing, so plan accordingly, adjust accordingly, I guess, I guess is what I'm actually saying. Uh, but definitely check it out, if you can. If not, uh... Wait till it comes out on DVD or Netflix. I guarantee you this is going to be a big one on Netflix or uh, or at your local DVD. But uh, don't don't illegally download this one. Uh, do support this because it's something new. It's not a Hollywood rehash. It's it's something different. And I do want to send the message to Hollywood to try new shit out. Not Michael Bay stuff. So try to get a legit try, try to do a legit version for this one. If you can't see it right now, give it a little bit, this thing will be on DVD or Blu-ray. Or streaming on Netflix. Well, signing off for now. I expect this weekend I plan on seeing Lockout, so uh tune back in later in a week to check out that. I think there's also I've received a couple of requests to do that new Avatar The Legend of Korra series, which is premiering this week, uh, I'll probably watch that, as long as, you know, something else doesn't pop up during that time period, or that time pe- uh, yeah, that showtime. So it'll probably be a little bit of a busy week on the channel. Signing off for now.